I'm Jim Duderstadt, uh, has been president of the university. Uh, every once in a while, they let me emerge from my crypt on the North Campus and come into Central Campus. I should also point out that you're sitting in a, uh, an amphitheater that really was designed along the lines of the Roman Colosseum, because this is where our faculty senate used to meet, and where uh, victims such as university presidents and deans and so forth would appear before them and get skewered. That's why these doors allow us to escape. Uh, just a quick comment about the Wiesner Symposium. Uh, in 1992, I had the honor of giving to uh, Jerry Wiesner the Vannevar Bush Award for outstanding service to the nation. Uh, I felt it was quite appropriate because he received four degrees from Michigan. Uh, of course, a baccalaureate, master's, and PhD, but he got a dual baccalaureate in both electrical engineering and mathematics. But in our discussion, I found out that when he was an undergraduate, uh, he also was the engineer for the student radio station uh, in a close partnership with another student who was the principal person that uh, spoke on that radio station by the name of Mike Wallace. A uh, little fact of importance. Uh, I have the opportunity to introduce my boss at some times, uh, Ralph Cicerone, president of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I chair the uh, Division of Policy and Global Affairs for the National Research Council that reports to, to Ralph. Uh, Ralph, this is his second trip to, to Ann Arbor in the cold. Uh, we got him to come back here just before the holidays uh, in much colder weather, I think, the, the Arctic uh, vortex was in, in place, uh, to receive an honorary degree from the university because of a really extraordinary uh, uh, career, which started off at Michigan in our Space Physics Research Laboratory and our Department of Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Space Sciences, which it was then. Uh, he went on and has served in many ways at uh, NCAR uh, as uh, a faculty member and then uh, uh, the uh, chancellor of the University of California, Irvine. And today, as president of the National Academy of Sciences, he is looked upon as uh, one of the most significant leaders of American science. And so it's uh, quite an honor to introduce him for our discussions this morning. Ralph. Thank you, Jim, and thanks to everybody for the opportunity to be here. I think we're all doing a lot of listening as well as speaking. I thought you were going to say that Jerry Wiesner helped to generate the electricity for the radio station too, but I guess he didn't have to do that. What I want to do to help to get things started this morning is uh, <clears throat> the topic. The topic is essentially providing mechanisms for academics to have input to the public policy issues surrounding science. The topic was one suggested by the organizing committee, and the more I got into it, I think there really is a lot to talk about. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do in exploring this topic is to give a little historical background and the current operations of the academies in the United States, and then give some examples of some of the reports and, and impact very quickly, and then talk towards the end about pathways that academics employ to get involved in the public policy issues or that the system uses to entice them into it. So let me get going quickly. I do have a fair number of slides that I want to talk from. <clears throat> the first was the, the very, very unusual happening during the middle of the Civil War that Congress and President Lincoln created the National Academy of Sciences. It's amazing how much they did in the midst of that very brutal and I think unanticipatedly uh, crucial Civil War. In 1862, they authorized the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued around the end of the year, early 1863. The creation of the National Academy of Sciences, and then in 1862, the Morrill Act that created public universities and access to higher education for this great population. I think they foresaw a nation emerging, although not everybody agreed that there would be one nation, and they wanted that nation to be very uh, well-placed for future development. The creation of any number of uh, 
capacities of the federal government. So it was really quite amazing. I've also come to realize how distinctive, if not unique, this academy is in the world situation, and I'll mention some of the reasons why I say that. But let me mention first one of the first projects that the Academy was asked to do, because if you read the, I guess this is maize and blue, but if you read the maize uh, phrase of what the Academy was asked to do, one of the first tasks was during the Civil War, the, uh, some of the naval batter, battles were going the way of the Confederacy because they had some ironclad battleships. So the Union forces had to respond, if not get ahead, but the problem of navigation on an iron ship with magnetic compasses was non-trivial, so the Academy was asked to look into a way. Uh, this replica unit was given to us by Tom Kasky, who some of you know is at NAS, an Institute of Medicine member, that had to be tailored for every ship, so these iron balls on both sides were adjustable. But Rosina Bierbaum mentioned that President Obama spoke to the Academy about uh, two years ago now on the 150th anniversary. And Obama referred to this, one of the first tasks the Academy had been given. And it was successful, the navigation method worked despite the iron all around the uh, magnetic device. And he looked out on the audience of NAS members and he said, you know, if that project hadn't succeeded, you people wouldn't be here today. And then he said, and neither would I. He, he, really pulled, he really pulled that off very well. One of the other early reports was advising the United States to adopt the metric system. That one didn't work. Uh, but some of the other early ones during the First World War, there was a need to be able to detect incoming aircraft, both here and in England, of course. And the method that was used is illustrated here and the individuals who were used to uh, monitor these hearing devices were themselves people with enhanced auditory capabilities, often blind people, uh, were chosen to do this work because they had enhanced auditory capabilities, frankly. Uh, a 1950s report before the launch of Sputnik and before our own satellites out of the Academy advised that Earth orbiting satellites were attainable, did some technical analysis, and talked about the need to get going. This particular device is launched by Bill Pickering, who was the head of JPL, uh, Jim Van Allen, after whom the Van Allen belts were named when they were discovered, and Ferner von Braun. But the project that they advised, which the government attempted to mount, failed on launch, so the Soviets got there first. In the mid-70s, the in a, Rosina Bierbaum talked about policy for science as well as science for policy. This was an organized meeting of the Academy and led to a report in PNAS, Nature and Science, simultaneously about the advisability of being very careful with recombinant DNA technology in particular several class of experiments for which the scientific community uh, set up a, a self-propagated moratorium until certain conditions were met. And the people in this photograph are Maxine Singer on your left, Norton Zinder, uh, Sidney Brenner, and Paul Berg, as I remember. It was an example of the scientific community setting up conditions for progress that the public could trust which and still allow for tremendous scientific progress. People still talk about that meeting and what came out of it. Today, uh, I've already mentioned the creation of the charter for the National Academy of Sciences. The National Research Council was created in the First World War, or before the First World War, partly to the, allow the academy to function better. The academy was too small. Uh, in some ways, too old. People were not as active as would be necessary across as many disciplines. So the National Research Council was created, and it still functions today. In fact, about three-quarters of the members of all the active committees 
writing these reports are not members of any one of the academies, but they're chosen to be the best possible experts from around the country and around the world, regardless of age and everything else. In the mid-60s, the National Academy of Engineering was created, an important part of the team today. And then in 1970, the Institute of Medicine. So these organizations function together, not only as honorific societies, you know, awarding prizes and membership and all kinds of uh, other activities, for example, international ones, but also to generate these advisory reports uh, that go back to the original mission of the NAS. And they work through the National Research Council. Although the IOM program goes largely on its own, the, the stream merges again in a very rigorous peer review process. So all of the reports that are issued uh, come out with peer review. They also have some important processes that I think distinguish us from things that go on around the rest of the world. There's a very rigorous conflict of interest policy uh, that's applied. It doesn't always succeed, but it's, it's largely successful, along with disclosures of financial interests and so forth, and any competing interests, as well as aligned interests of everybody who works on all the committees. I'll go through some examples of results in the next few minutes with a few slides that illustrate any number of uh, topics. And I won't mention all of them, but a committee that John Holdren used to chair, the Committee on International Security and Arms Control, some of you have heard the true stories about how they created a, a means for back-channel communication with their Soviet counterparts before the fall of the Soviet Union, of course, in the 70s and 80s. And the members of this committee, the so-called CSAC committee, that I think at that time John was chaired by Pief Panofsky, uh, could report to the American government that their Soviet colleagues had many of the same views on the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and it could be a time for President Reagan at the time and Gorbachev to meet, and they did, and it led to some very important strategic arms limitation talks and nuclear weapons controls. Well, recently, the committee, a few years ago, decided that in talking with the Chinese in similar ways, there were problems with translation of English and China, Chinese, Mandarin. So they've created, a, at great effort, a glossary of all the relevant terms that have to be discussed in English and Mandarin. Uh, just to go through an array of important problems and issues how to ensure better minority participation in science and technology in the United States, what is the value to criminal investigations of forensic evidence based on the mineral composition of lead bullets, uh, one that was finished a couple of years ago that Chad Holliday of the NAE led, responding to a request from the federal government on recognizing the importance of research universities on the susceptibility of private universities to invest, investment equity decreases in, uh, endowments. But now, of course, the tremendous pressure that public research universities are under, so the extent to which the United States depends on research universities and what actions have to be taken by various parties, state governments, industries, universities themselves, and the federal government. Uh, an example of a couple of reports who, whose impact didn't happen that quickly. One was on revisions to the patent system. As I remember, Rick Levin read, led this report in 2004 uh, in light of modern science and technology, uh, a report that's led to the creation of a science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State. It's being redone now. The, the famous Rising Above the Gathering Storm report that Norm Augustine led with many recommendations for how to allow and permit the United States to remain competitive in this century, if not lead many fields. A number on science and education, uh, 
Gil Lohman participated in an earlier version of the Science, Evolution, and Creationism report. This report was not requested by any level of government anywhere, but instead represented the, the need for scientists to speak out on biological evolution, to review the evidence that shows how overwhelming it is, to remind people that the Pope himself has declared that he has no problem with evolution, that it is a fact, and so forth, and to try to put the, the study into understandable language, to be as unthreatening as possible to religious beliefs and still to be uh, friendly at the same time. The previous version of this report was cited four or five times in Judge Jones' decision on the Dover School Board, I think it was Kitz Miller versus the Dover School Board, uh, where the judge, who was a Bush appointee, by the way, had a need to define what is science in the light of efforts to bring intelligent design into science classrooms. And the judge found that the previous version of this report, in fact, presented the best definitions of science that he could find and cited the fact that science has to result in some prediction about the future, things that can be tested. And through that reasoning on his own, uh, ruled against the intelligent design people in Pennsylvania. So we had no idea that that would happen out of this book, but it shows that just creating good materials sometimes has a value beyond the immediately perceived ones. A couple of more interesting topics that show the array of requests that come that, for example, John Holdren and Rosina have just summarized that the, the PCAST is, a, is asked to take on just for the president. But if you look at all the needs of the federal agencies and departments, and indeed the states, I'll get to that in a minute, for advice that underlies decisions that they should be making, you can get it. This report, Measuring Poverty, as I recall, didn't have any impact for nearly 15 years. But now the poverty levels and the measures, the metrics that were recommended years ago by this committee in behavioral sciences and education are now being used. A 2014 report, the growth of incarceration in the United States, was in response to requests to quantify uh, how incarceration is being used in the United States, its numbers, its growth, outcomes, and so forth. Uh, the one in the lower left-hand corner, the polygraph, was a study that, as I recall, the FBI was not very keen to commission, but they were ordered to do it. And they adopted the recommendations of this report over a Labor Day weekend on a slow, slow news weekend rather grudgingly, but I think everybody looks back at it now and feels that we learned a lot about the value of polygraph examinations either for specific questions or for general background. And it turns out the lie detector is much more useful in examining specific issues as opposed to general backgrounds. So it can be applied better in security clearance matters. Just on and on principles and practices for federal statistical agency, uh, things that I know Jim Jackson knows a lot about. We do some classified work occasionally. This report was not intended to be classified. It was classified after it was written, so-called by comp compilation. It led to battles over a few years of how we could get the report released. And it had to do with susceptibility of the electric power delivery system. Uh, a final category I'll mention, and then I'm going to stop in just a minute, and that is about the so-called decadal surveys of scientific fields. These reports have become progressively more important over the last 50 or 60 years. The latest example of the survey of astronomy and astrophysics, New Worlds, New Horizons, is something like the sixth one in a series of decadal surveys. They've become uh, very useful to a number of federal agencies in planning, especially for large expenditure items in certain fields where they really need the advice, the critical advice of the affected communities. So uh, I used to think that these reports were generated by kind of a love fest of astronomers and astrophysics. 
now I've learned over the last two that it's more like a bloodletting. There is, there is enormous uh, work done over a period of time where people from all the affected disciplines, uh, competing methods, competing parts of the country, get together and slowly work out a set of priorities. Recently, the, the, the Republican chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the House that has to deal with so much of science has said what a fan he's become of these decadal surveys. And we hope that the quality of the, the ones like in earth sciences and oceanography and so forth are now going to remain as high as previous ones and be useful. The extending the life of the Hubble Space Telescope was an interesting one where NASA had decided under Administrator O'Keefe some years ago that the Hubble Space Telescope had become hopelessly impaired and it should not be supported anymore and that the risk of, for example, a human spaceflight mission to fix it was too high. There were objections all over the place that basically people saying this is too serious a decision. So they asked the Academy to do a study and, and sure enough the committee came out recommending that there should be a rescue mission and the rest is very pleasant history that it, that it worked and the life has been extended for a large number of years. Uh, I have this slide up to indicate a couple more items. Uh, this report on the sensitivity of, of uh, naval operations to climate change was commissioned by the Navy. We received some wonderful praise and thanks by some admirals after the report was finished. It was a big success. Uh, this report on sea level rise for West Coast states was requested by those states as they prepare for infrastructure expenses in the coming generation. They wanted to know what could be anticipated for sea level rise. Some of you may know, there's a couple of geologists here, that the anticipated sea level rise, at least in the earlier stages of the next several decades, will be different uh, north and south of a line drawn across parts of California. So this has turned out to be useful. The, this report was released, I think, last month on two different kinds of geoengineering to potentially slow down climate change, which I won't go into now. And this one was requested by President Bush as he took office back in 2001. We did that one in five weeks, unusually fast. Uh, the last, we certainly got asked a lot of questions, not only about biomedical research, but quite more often in public health. The delivery of public health, the management of it, the costs, factors of equity, international comparisons, effectiveness, emergency delivery, and so forth. And, and it represents just a major source of effort, uh, mostly from the Institute of Medicine, but not exclusively. For example, the continuing evaluation of the health risks and toxicology of exposure to formaldehyde, it's an issue that doesn't go away uh, because there's so much formaldehyde in structures and in trailers and so forth. So, of course, one of the most influential of the last 20 years was entitled To Air as Human, which did a fairly dispassionate analysis of errors uh, that occur in hospitals and what could be done to limit them. And it has helped, to, I think, to change the culture of medical practice and of health professionals in hospitals. It's been very, very influential. That one was led by the Institute of Medicine. The most recent one about three weeks ago was about chronic fatigue syndrome with an analysis of the reality of the whole uh, syndrome, as it were, with a recommendation to give it a much more clinically justified name. So uh, there's certainly been examinations on drinking water, nutritional toxic, uh, nutritional diet issues, as well as toxicity of substances, and of course of energy efficiency. Let me now get back to the topic of the morning. First of all, we have a resource here with this academy structure, if you will, and that the, that the federal government is willing 
to make requests of an outside agency, an outside body over which it essentially has no control. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the world, I have found out. For example, the Royal Society, which many of us respect greatly, uh, the officers have complained to me several times that they have no channel with which to work, with which to engage the United Kingdom's government. They have many important personal contacts because these people are highly respected as individuals, but they don't have the kind of uh, uh, method and instruments that we do. In many countries, the academies that have been created are government agencies themselves. So it's difficult to, to convince people that the reports that some of these academies generate are separate from that of the government. Many of those academy budgets are controlled by the government. They work on annual appropriations, for example. We have no annual appropriation here. Uh, more something that we can help to control is the science, engineering, and medical establishments, if you will, in other countries are badly divided. They do not work together. There are exceptions, and it's wonderful to see, but in many countries, the scientists and engineers and medical people are fighting amongst themselves. And if they're not fighting, at least they don't work together. And they don't have a united front, which uh, I think it was President Schlissel a few minutes ago who talked about disciplines not knowing where, or problems not knowing which academic departments to go to. We really have to work together. So it's very disappointing to see in most countries that these parts of the scientific capability do not work together. Uh, there are some changes which I'll mention which are encouraging. Uh, we have fairly well developed processes to maintain credibility and to attain it. I mentioned conflict of interest and disclosures. Uh, you can challenge the success of both of those. There are always problems that everybody tries to deal with, but for the most part they work. Uh, the other thing that Congress likes about the way we work is that nearly all the work is done by unpaid volunteers. People like all of you in this room, as I said, like 75% of the committee work is done by people who are not members of the academy, generally younger people. They're not being paid for it. So Congress understands that, at least they think they do. The fact that we try to use an evidentiary base, that is an evidence-based approach, to any conclusion, finding, and certainly to any recommendation we make. In some countries, the viability of pro bono participation is not very high. For example, there are some new academies across the African continent that are very encouraging with inspirational people leading them and getting them started, but there's not a lot of capacity there for, for scientists and, and higher education experts to go off doing something under, for somebody else on a pro bono uh, uh, basis. It's, it's discouraging for us to see. Uh, in many countries, they're fragile governments in the first place. So it's difficult to gear up to take on a long-term issue, for example, if you're not at all confident the government's going to be in place. So we have some real advantages in this country, and I think it accounts for some of our success. Let me talk now about some channels for academic input to policy. I've just mentioned academies. Uh, there are even other academies. For example, the National Academy of Public Administration has some recognition in Congress, and occasionally they will be asked to do some studies that turn out to be important. They're, for various reasons, they're not as well developed and they don't have a, a lot of uh, bandwidth, but they have done some successful work. There are some state academies, which I think have a, a large uh, margin to improve and to be more effective. Some of you know the Texas Academy of Medicine, Engineering, Science, and Technology. It was created by Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison and Rick Smalley, some, who used to be at Michigan, as you know, working together some years ago, and it's being carried on ably by some other Texas people. They're doing some important work in Texas education, uh, making people in Texas much more aware of what their research universities are doing. It's quite impressive. Uh, there's a new one in Virginia that Senator Mark Warner himself has created uh, 
frankly, getting Kay Bailey Hutchison to help him copy for Virginia what Texas has done. There is a new one in Washington State, Jim Cook and his colleagues. They just did a very important study for Washington State about a year and a half ago on some uh, agriculturally important pest problems that was just done to world-class standards and I think very important. Professional societies, we have a very, very well-developed list, if you will, and capability of professional societies in the United States. I don't know how many, probably everybody in this room belongs to at least one, if not four or five. But I'll mention them again in a minute. We certainly have a, a long established, although it's been interrupted a couple of times in history, the Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and, and OSTP, which helped to coordinate across the whole government. We used to have the Office of Technology Assessment. In fact, Rosina worked there for some years. There may be, Gil, I think you did? Committees, Committees of OTA. And uh, Rush Holt, when Dr. Holt was a congressman, I believe he tried on occasion to restore OTA. It was abolished by our Congress around 1995. And if you talk to people who know anything about OTA, it had a great deal of capability. Now at, at the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council with NAE and IOM, we employ something like 29 people who used to work at OTA, and these are key people. So we, uh, but I think restoring OTA would create another channel for academic input. In the OTA work in those days, they often called upon people in universities to help out with their analyses and reports. Now there are some channels for this input that also bring career opportunities to the table. And I want to start by mentioning the American Association for the Advancement of Science Fellows Program, AAAS Fellows. Uh, maybe Rush Holt can answer questions later, but there are probably 150 or 200 positions now, mostly for new PhDs, occasionally an MD, people who will work for a year in Washington with the possibility to have that term extended. And as I understand it, they are just grabbed up by congressional offices and the executive branch because these resources are so valuable. So most of these young people have multiple opportunities to move into one of those offices for their year or two, and they end up having an impact. I'll say a little bit more about that. Now, some of the other disciplinary scientific societies like the American Chemical Society, American Geophysical Union, Sociological, AS, uh, ASCE, American Society for Microbiology, ASME, and so forth, also have programs. Many of them work through the AAAS and contribute their kind of expertise and a way for their members to participate through the fellows who are given these assignments. These are not only very important channels for academic input into the science policy process, but many of them bring about career opportunities for young people. Now, not all of the young people who take these positions continue in science policy. I have some rough statistics. Many of them go back to what they were doing beforehand. Uh, most of them, if they do that, feel very much informed. They have become even more clear in their commitment to, let's say, a science career. So uh, there's no right answer here. The fact is these are opportunities for young people to explore interests and to make contacts, for example, in Washington if they wish. We have a small program at the NAS that we call Mirzahan Fellows. And again, uh, the NAE and the IOM participate with us. We have about 25 young people a year who are either just reached their MD or PhD or are already past it, who want to test out Washington. So we help to give them assignments and some mentorship to get to know Washington. These, it's very competitive. We could probably accommodate 75 or 100 of these people. We can only do about 25 a year. There's a new program in California, relatively new. It's in its fifth or sixth year now, the California Council on Science and Technology. It's funded by the Moore Foundation, and I understand 
that the Moore Foundation might be interested in receiving similar proposals from other states. Some of you are nodding. You probably know more than I do. Uh, I'll mention that one again. And then there's at least one foundation, and I think others, that uh, in the case of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with our Institute of Medicine, they've got five or six fellowships that they use for mid-career people who want to learn more about health policy, uh, mostly health policy. And they come to Washington for periods of maybe a year each. So there are a lot of these fellowship opportunities. This particular focus has been on those with career opportunities as well. Some of these career steps, I just mentioned the AAAS fellows, but I'm told that approximately 40, 50 percent of these uh, people remain in public policy positions in the federal government, uh, perhaps NGOs, state governments, state health uh, uh, administrations, and so forth, and about a quarter each return to what they were doing in their original sector, or they move into some completely new enterprise. The California Council on Science and Technology, they've only got about 50 or 60 alums now, but they can already tell that about a third of them have moved into California state government in permanent positions. About a third are in private sector and nonprofits, and then a, a, a fraction in academia. The Mirza Young Fellows, we've had 750 so far after about 20 years now. And typically a third go into policy. We're finding them in increasingly important positions in Washington where you can just see the impact that they're having because these people are really well grounded. They've gone through PhD or even MD PhD programs. A third back to academia and a third are scattered around the US and the world. And some of them go on to apply for AAAS fellowships to get an even firmer grounding. So this is an exciting group. I want to end with a question. Uh, as you deal with students here and your own mentees, what do you tell them about if they are interested in exploring public policy uh, uh, careers? Uh, when do you tell them is a good time? I have rather conservative views on this, so I'm, but I won't tell you what they are yet. But I think this is an important issue. For, for that individual to have a satisfying career and maximum input, when is the best time, of course there's a spectrum of answers, but when is the best time for each of these individuals to enter these fields? So I will stop there and thank you. I should also point out that the uh, covers of reports that uh, Ralph put up there represent a truly extraordinary uh, resource, a repository of studies done by the National Academy. And although you usually think about these as something you have to purchase from the National Academy's press, several years ago the Academy presidents, led by Ralph, agreed that they could be downloaded for free. So if you have an interest in a particular study, you can download it, and if you're a member of Amazon Prime, you can then send it to your email address and it appears on your Kindle or your iPad. And so you now have the complete resources of the National Academy available to you. Uh, let me move now to our, our next speaker. Uh, that's Len Fisk, who has held almost every position you can imagine in the space program, uh, both within this country and beyond. Uh, he is a member of most of the academies. He was uh, associate director and chief scientist of NASA. Uh, while at the University of New Hampshire, he created the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space, where both my daughter and son-in-law work right now, so that's why I mentioned that. Uh, he headed the Space Science Studies Board of the National Academies, and most recently, he was just elected as president of the Committee on Space Research, COSPAR, which is an international organization. So with that as a quick background, then let me introduce you. Uh, I, I, as the title says, I want to talk this morning about the challenges with regard to uh, space policy. Uh, and since the theme of this symposium is about the role of universities in, in science policy making, uh, I, w I in fact offer myself as an example of what university faculty can 
the role that we can play. Um, I teach a graduate course here at the university in space policy that's taken each year by more than 50 graduate students. On, on, it's on, and I also obviously have opinions on uh, s space policy um, based on that long litany of things that my friend Jim Duderstadt was kind enough to summarize of all the all in my past. Um, but there are a variety of avenues then that are available to me to try and uh, express those opinions. Um, committees for the NRC, which Ralph just spoke about, uh, direct contact with the administration and, and uh, Congress, white papers, opinion papers, uh, and uh, the idea is to try to influence the space policy of, of the nation. And a uh, Coast Bar uh, mantle that I have just assumed as president of Coast Bar, and quite honestly, I'm trying to influence the space policy of other nations now as well. So what then are the challenges with regard to, to space policy? Now, one might, one might think that an important issue was deciding whether or not NASA should go to Mars, and if so, how. Um, nope, not that important compared to the, sp the centrality of space in our civilization and the policies that we should have to maximize the assets that we deploy in space. Consider the following facts. Our technological civilization is entirely dependent on satellites in orbit whether it's for communications, direct broadcasting, reliable weather forecasts, for the location services from GPS, which are also used, by the way, to, to uh, time uh, almost all electronic financial transactions. And of course, for our military, which cannot defend us without the use of satellites in orbit. Rather, our assets in space are, an essential, are essential components of the infrastructure of our civilization. Fact two, the science budget of NASA, which supports basic research by making and interpreting observations from space, is actually comparable to the research budget of the entire National Science Foundation. Space is expensive. But it's always important to recognize when you look at that kind of expense about what it is spent on. 85% of it is spent on people, primarily scientists and engineers. And so NASA is actually a sponsor of one of the largest workforces engaged in basic research in the nation. Third, the primal threats to our civilization global climate change, space weather, can only be understood and dealt with using observations from space. We have insufficient knowledge of the strategies available to us to mitigate against climate change, and more, and more likely, what adaptation strategies will be necessary. This knowledge can be acquired through comprehensive observations from the global perspective of space. Space weather and the disturbances therein present hazards of unknown significance to our technological civilization, ranging from the inefficient use of power grids to the disastrous elimination of extensive portions of the infrastructure uh, 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 on which uh, both in space and on the ground, on which the very quality of our life depends. Again, only through extensive observations from space can, we, can the predictive capability to protect us against space weather events be developed. Now it follows, therefore, that the challenges associated with space policy are actually relatively straightforward. We need to recognize the centrality of space for the future of our civilization and the policies that we have 
should allow us to deploy our capabilities in space as effectively as possible in the strategic and economic interests of the nation. Now, I'm not going to say, I'm actually not going to talk about money today. It's always nice to say, well, we need more money to do this. And that's certainly true. But I have the profound belief that if we were simply to raise the consciousness through our policies of the centrality of space for our society, that even in this times of physical, physical constraint, that the needed resources might be more readily available to us. So what then are the issues, some of the issues that we need to address? Concentrating here on civil space, which is, of course, the science, commercial pursuits, and exploration. The policies associated with military space have a different and obvious motivation. However, we should recognize that civil and military space are, of course, closely intertwined. They're generally mutually supportive, but on an issue which I'll address in a moment, they can be in conflict. So, challenge one. Research on global climate change and space weather. Research on global climate change and space weather requires observations from space. As just noted, these observations can be provided by the space programs of many nations, even nations with small developing space programs, since usually one of their first satellites is a satellite that remotely senses their environment. We need to take advantage of all these observations, sharing data to understand the Earth and its space environment, and where appropriate, deploy our capabilities to cooperative projects. Given the capabilities of the United States, such worldwide cooperation offers us an opportunity for strategic leadership. Challenge two, ITAR. We need to recognize the impediment to international cooperation in space research imposed by the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR, in which satellites, particularly remote sensing satellites, are considered to be a munitions. Primarily, although publicly available data is generally not regulated by ITAR, the sharing of knowledge about how the data was collected or the capabilities of the instruments that collect the data can be, as, in, as is any opportunity for flying instruments on another nation's spacecraft or making our spacecraft available to other nations. This is a clear example where policies need to be based on fact. The ITAR regulations need to protect the true strategic interests of the United States and not be based on the out-of-date concept that the United States has technologies available to other nations that we need to protect. Challenge three, cooperation with China in space. We need to recognize also that it is current policy not to cooperate in space in any regard with China. Policy is very strange. Since we had more scientific cooperation in space with the Soviet Union during the height of the Cold War than we have now with China, which is a principal trading partner and the manufacturer of many of our high-tech products. And it's important to note this restriction on cooperation with China is unique to space. Cooperation with China occurs in many other science disciplines. Challenge four, workforce issues. With regard to workforce issues, NASA not only supports an important technological workforce, but space has been a powerful draw that encourages students to pursue careers in science and engineering. We need to be sure that there are no governmental policies. And those of you who are on the inside of this issue will know what I'm talking about, about uh, if that place restrictions that impede NASA's ability to encourage and inspire the next generation to become engineers and scientists, or even simply to ensure a public interested and supportive of science and technology. Challenge five, space as a global commons. We need to recognize, encourage, and enable space as a global commons. A commons, of course, is a piece of land 
and, uh, owned by and used by all members of a community as in a pasture used by the residents of a village. Many nations in the world view space as a global commons, a resource not owned by any one nation, but future, crucial to the future of all humankind. Indeed, human beings around the world view space not just as a place, but as symbolic of the future itself. The developing, developed space programs of the world should take it upon themselves to exert strategic leadership to assist all nations that wish to use the global commons of space for peaceful purposes. They will do so not by dominance, which is no longer possible, but by example and in cooperation, all with the goal of making the opportunities of space available to all nations with the desire to pursue them. Challenge 5A, potential conflict with military use of space. Need to recognize that space as a global commons is an area of potential conflict between the civil and military space policy. There is no equivalent for space of the law of the sea, which guides all aspects of the behavior of nations on the world, world's ocean. Rather, space is basically a lawless frontier in which there's only peer pressure and self-interest to guide the behavior of nations. There appears to be some desire on the part of the United States military to retain this unconstrained state of affairs, which would appear to run counter to having space as a global commons. The overall go policy goal for space, the overall goal for space policy. Above all, we should have space policies that enable civil space to provide the knowledge required for our, the su survival of our civilization. We are a society rife with strife often rooted in the past, often instigated by those who would exploit the ignorance and the most base instincts of their followers, and in all cases, a serious impediment to the well-being of the people affected. We are a society in denial about how fragile is our civilization on our insignificant planet in the backwater of the cosmos, whether due to our own misconduct or some cosmic event. Civil space needs to continuously remind us of our vulnerabilities and ever call upon society to apply its talent to what is really important, the well-being of our people and the survival of our civilization. Our policies governing civil space must ensure that civil space can be the guide that leads us safely past the vulnerabilities of our planet, offers opportunity to improve the well-being of our people and points the way towards a future in which we are a space-faring civilization, secure and prosperous. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is James Jackson, uh, Don Daniel Katz, Distinguished University Professor of Psychology. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine and also has just been appointed to the National Science Board. He has, for the last decade, led one of the most important research activities of the university, our Institute for Social Research, and today uh, is uh, currently directing the most extensive social, politi uh, social, political, behavioral, and mental and physical health surveys of the African American and black Caribbean populations ever conducted. Uh, James? Thanks a lot, Jim. I appreciate that. Um, I hate talking after people who talk about space. I, I just, I, 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 I told Lynn last night, we were having dinner together, and I said, well, what are you going to talk about? And um, he said, well, I don't know, I'll figure it out and so on. And what did we see, you know, an inspiring talk about spacefaring and what the future looks like and so on. My job is to talk about the challenges of the social and behavioral sciences. Uh, so I think that's important as well, although I must admit I got inspired uh, by Lynn's talk. So it's a, it's a pleasure this morning. I want to uh, welcome our honored guest. Um, many of them I uh, know, and it's good to see them, and to my colleagues and students at the University of Michigan. So it's my pleasure to speak for a few minutes about the challenges that we face in public policy um, as social scientists today. 
as the director of the Institute for Social Research, uh, whose model is social science in the public interest, it indicates that we are steeped in the belief that we have a duty and a responsibility to use our scientific skills and knowledge to further the understanding of the human condition. The social sciences in general represent the human sciences, the branch of science inquiry focused on the institutions and interactions among people that make up the fabric of daily life. Uh, we are the sciences who confront a physical reality, an area of study that is created, maintained, and altered by human decision making and the human experience. This poses a significant challenge to our scientists in formulating theoretical perspectives and generalizable results to build our future advances. The ISR, for example, represents some of the best applied sciences and indeed is the emergent interface between the biological, physical, and engineering sciences, which is happening uh, today. The collaborations and interdisciplinary perspectives that are emerging are particularly impressive in providing a framework and applications to human institutions. For example, the index of energy attitudes and policy, uh, the biological and social interface, uh, the cultural dimensions of sustainability, just to mention a few. Our disciplinary progenitors in sociology, psychology, political science, linguistics, anthropology, and economics among the social sciences provide the basic science building blocks for the applied discoveries that directly serve the public interest. Without this joint venture, basic social science and applied social sciences, we would not be able to complete our mission in the public interest. We have built the finest infrastructure, the National Science Foundation, NASA, as we talked about before, and procedures, scientific peer review, vetting scientific projects in the world. Parts of this infrastructure, especially in the social and behavioral sciences, is under threat today. What are the challenges to the social sciences right now? Uh, these challenges actually are not new. Uh, they, they, in fact, span decades within periods of in, uh, intense scrutiny, like today. Uh, some of you may not be old enough, many of you are, to remember what happened in the early 1980s. Uh, these challenges include things like the common language for uncommon endeavors. The social and behavioral sciences uses a common language. Uh, we are not as formalized as the physical sciences and the biological sciences. And there are many people, um, many lay people, who think they really understand when they read a social and behavioral sciences paper. Uh, they don't. The second thing is the misunderstandings of the mission and content of the social sciences. Um, there are a lot of people who don't understand what that mission is, what that content is, and I think some of that falls on us as a responsibility to explain our sciences a little bit better uh, so that people really understand. Finally, we face the scientific discoveries as everyone knew that. Uh, sometimes uh, people say things like, uh, my grandmother knew that and she told me that, uh, so what are you telling me new? Uh, social science and social science discoveries uh, really have that um, really peculiar fact, uh, once shown, uh, once exposed, it looks like everybody always knew that. Uh, trust me, we didn't do that. And finally, there's a fear of reflection that's inherent in the sciences that's devoted to shedding a light on what the human condition is all about. Uh, sometimes we really don't want to know about what the social and behavioral sciences can tell us about ourselves, the way we live, and the way we interact with others. In fact, we need to be concerned when our discoveries in the physical and biological sciences outstrip our capacity and perspectives on building institution and frameworks in which to more fruitfully exploit and employ these discoveries. This is the task and the responsibilities of the social sciences. In conclusion then, combined with another human invention, the American Research University, we have created an impressive engine for scientific discovery and application. 
Our task uh, is training and preparing the next generation of physical and biological scientists and engineers to face the challenges of our physical and social world. We have to keep pace in the human sciences to understand and implement the organizations and policies that facilitate new physical and biological discoveries and applications. After all, public policy is a human invention applied to human institutions. It is a unified mosaic of scientific endeavors that will promote our prosperity and future national and international advances. Finally, our world has become even more complicated in recent decades. Uh, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, adject poverty um, in pockets of plenty, uh, climate and sustainability concerns, and so on. We need stronger cooperation between government and research universities and funding and executing even better scientific endeavors, including the social sciences. There is truly a unity among scientific branches of the tree. As science citizens and scientists, we must attend uh, to the public policies that form the mechanisms for the um, execution of this partnership. The emerging world needs more attention to uh, science and technology education and greater attention to the appropriate conduct conduct of public policy formulation and execution in this realm. Research universities, and especially public research universities, have a very special responsibility to provide education and training. So I have three recommendations, just to quickly say that. Social and behavioral sciences must be part of STEM education um, in terms of the production of the next generation and expansion of uh, science and technology workforce. Second, social and behavioral sciences must be considered in our determination of science funding and science policy. And finally, we must um, use all of our social and behavioral science knowledge in clearly placing the public in the development and execution of science and technology policy. Thank you.